بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونتوب إليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا the Lord's name, the merciful benefactor, the merciful redeemer. All praise belongs to Allah. We praise him. We seek his help. We ask his forgiveness. We repent unto Allah. We turn to him, always seeking his mercy and forgiveness. We seek refuge to him from all of our weaknesses and faults and all of our errors and mistakes and sins. I give open testimony. I bear witness that there is no deity except Allah, that He is one and alone. We associate nothing in worship with Allah. I bear witness the the Prophet Muhammad, to whom the Quran was revealed, is His servant and His messenger. And so He is indeed the seal of all the prophets. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulullah Kareem. Praise be to Allah, cherish the sustainer of the universe. We pray that Allah's prayers and peace be upon the most honorable, most excellent messenger, Muhammad, upon his descendants, upon his companions, upon the righteous all, all the believers, upon all, all the righteous believers, and me. The Allah's name, the merciful benefactor, we thank Allah. Thank Allah that He has guided us to the path that He has chosen for human beings to live, that He Himself has chosen to the religion that Allah He Himself has offered, the religion that indeed Allah Himself has named. It is a very special opportunity for human beings to receive a word from the one who created them. And the one who cherishes us, who sustains us, who has originated our forms and given us a destiny for our forms and for our life. And he provides for that life. He is our rod. He is the one that sustains our life, provides all the provisions that we need for our life, not just our physical life, but for our moral life, for our spiritual life, for our intellectual life for our emotional life, for every dimension that Allah has created, he himself designed it, and then he gives direction for it, and then he supplies those things that are needed to advance, to purify, to cultivate. So on this great day, we can say that on the Juma, Salatul Juma, it is a call to Islam, the symbolic of that great, of the great call of Islam. The Islamic call has become, I think, the just recognized and respected by human beings, by Muslims from the time it was first revealed to, from, from the time the Quran was revealed, from the time the Quran was revealed, and Islam as a religion began to be formed and shaped as an, a concept by itself in advancing the previous uh, revelations. But the Islam itself reached a point or revealed that it is the fulfillment of the previous scriptures. Prophet Muhammad, he is the seal of the prophet. He is the conclusion, and we are blessed to be able to come to that. And Allah says, you don't come to that unless he opens the heart. Allah says, no one comes to the Islam uh, unless Allah opens their heart to it. So it's very special, but it is open to all. It's still an invitation as they call. It is still an inv invitation to all humanity. Beginning with the reading of the Quran, Allah says, Bismillah of Menahim. We send you only as a mercy for all the worlds. And Allah says, again in Surah Sabah, Allah says, and the translator will say only because this is what this grammatical phrase is saying. Why mad? No for other, not for any other reason. When someone says that even in English, what are they saying? They're saying this is specific. This is being specified for not any other reason. You know, don't confuse anything. Don't confuse it with anything else. This is specified as a mercy. Only as a mercy for all the world. 
We have not sent you all, and we have sent you to all mankind. Well, man, again, well, man, I'll send that cat. Uh, we have not sent you. It's challenging to the intellect to read the Quran, and that's what it's intended to do. It's written that way. Read. But how? In the name of your Lord who created. So looking for the patterns, the systems in the creation is going to aid our reading. Then Allah says, or oh, another reference to uh, this revealing to the Prophet, Surah Al Maida. Yeah, are you a Rasul? Bellet ma unzila ilaika mir rabbik. O Messenger, convey that which has been revealed to you from your Lord. Wa in lam tef al. And if you do not, bama balakta rasul. Risalat, risalat tahu. Parsing this out a little bit. But it says, O ye, O Master, convey that which has been revealed to you from your Lord. And if you do not, that automatically gets someone's attention, right? I mean, it's just natural for the human being, human nature, right? Coming up on our mother, right? She's checking our conduct, right? She's measuring our conduct. She's even measuring our expressions. You better not even have the wrong expression on your face because she's reading it. She's reading the way you walk, the way you sit, brother. Put your, put your shirt in, right? Remember how discipline. So this is like a reminder or a cautioning note, isn't it? And we have, if you do not, and that's coming from the Lord of the world. Now this is to the message, so I know it's gonna have, how we are fit into this, right? He's being, and we know he's, he's, he's seen as pure in his character. He has a history of his, of his character being pure and honesty. But yet Allah said, and if you do not, I like to think that that's been intended for us more than it is for the prophet. But Allah, right? If you do not, then you have not. He said, and if you do not, uh, then uh, your Lord, oh, then you will not have delivered his message. Let's see, I think it gives my attention. Right? The other two references says we have um, we have sent you, our son We have sent, we have revealed to you. But here it says you have not sent his message, not their message. Right? Which really helps us to understand that we are still just Allah. It's still under totally under Allah's control. So when we think about the Islamic call, we see these uh, how the Islamic call is being. Given to the prophet, he's the one who's bringing the call. Allah, it's Allah's call, but his messenger is making the call to Allah. I think that's very clear for all of us. It's been, all of us are very clear on that. Then you have not have delivered, you have not have delivered the message, right? Uh, and his message, have delivered his message. And Allah will protect you from the people. And Allah does not guide the unbelieving people. Yet when we're reading as followers of the prophet, as Muslims identifying as believers, believing Muslims, and subject to all the laws that govern, govern Islam and govern our faith, all the guidance that Allah has given, then I think it's reasonable for us to assume that this uh, accountability that is being expressed to the Prophet, right, is something that should be transferred to the, the one to whom the call is being made. The call is being obligated, right, to be shown, it's being emphasized that the caller has a responsibility to convey. And that's a big word. The word to convey is a big word. That's it's not just reciting because he could have said that. He could have said just recite the message. No, stay going beyond the outer, the outer form of the message. He's saying, make this, make this message reach, reach its objectives. Apply this message, uh, give this message out with respect for the conditions, for the circumstances, even for the weaknesses of the people. So Saba, uh, in the Shura of Saba, the prophet is given this accountability that I think the reader is supposed to see it being transferred to the believer. We're inheriting the responsibility. Inheriting of the message, the responsibility that comes with the message because we know the prophet was given the responsibility. He's being held accountable. And this is to be seen both 
individually and collectively. Because it's an ummah. The community is an ummah that's being raised up. It's, commun it's uh, a community that is the product of the Prophet's message. The ummah to Islami, the community of Islam, the ummah of Rasulullah, the community of Rasulullah, to continue multiplying the model. And the best way, and of course, the best way to see the model and fulfillment is in a collective focus, in a community. So the message is to be given, but it's to be conveyed and the transferring of responsibility to those to whom the, to whom the message is being, who are the recipients. And Allah says, we sent not an apostle except to teach in the language of his people. I think we all love them. Oh, we all love them. We all welcome them. Uh, and maybe because of the time that we come up in, right? Our generation, in time, in terms of the evolution of, of humanity or evolved evolution of humanity, of life on this earth, and the growth of this powerful intellect, there will be some issues before this message can reach its fulfillment. And look how sensitive the message is says the mess of Prophet, when he comes, he has to respect the language of the people. He has to respect the cultural language of the people. The language that's been developed, uh, uh, realized from just their own common sense, maybe from their own uh, influ environmental influence. Cultural language, social language is their language. We have a cultural language. But we have a nice cultural language. <laughs> Everybody does catch our cultural language. <laughs> Sometimes it would just be a, a, a grunt, right? <laughs> but we know, and believe it or not, anthropology sees calls this a, a work, a speech community, a word community. They study communities based on their, how they relate. And we know the uh, Thrice, uh, they were held, oh, they held so high because of their language. Classic language and poetry. You're not an educated or refined person and it's, 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 it's viewed by Arabs, and I call Arabs stamp, if you don't have background in poetry. They say you don't fully understand the Quran, this is what they say, unless you have a, a foundation in the background of poetry, the use of words and language, inferences, right? But the minds are awfully involved. Man, Muhammad, may Allah forgive me, in paradise. He loved poetry, and I learned to value poetry from reading his poetry. And it challenged, it was very challenging. And I noticed that it was not so much what the conscious mind registers from reading poetry, it's what the subconscious mind gathers from this uh, interplay between words and ideas and thoughts that are really constituted in the environment you come up with. Because in poems, we spoke to conditions, the thinking of people, the behavior of people, the faults of people. So poetry language itself is very important. So when we read this verse, Allah is, Allah is showing us what? That the message has a sensitivity. No matter where the people are, no matter what the culture. And the prophets, Allah, that is a, they don't come unless they speak, unless they respect the language of the people, unless they can relate to their culture, relate the message to their cultural circumstances. Never did Allah send a messenger or a message that wasn't sensitive to the mental, moral, or the spiritual state of the people. We had a very peculiar spiritual state, very peculiar. And our brothers and sisters who feel that their life will be improved by an accident or a lottery ticket, mm -hmm. that's a spiritual defect. We love them. If we could get them away from depending on that chance, you may just that's an idol. And they, they form him and shape him with some stones and wood and say, that's chance. And chance will be an idol. That helps us understand the problem of the prophet prayers of peace of heart and face in his own hometown. Never did Allah send a message except to speak in there, the language of those people. So Islam, what does this tell us? Tell us that our religion doesn't aim at difficulty. It's not looking for our difficult equations, right, to explain our relationship with Allah, which translates to a relationship with ourselves, each of us, individually. And that is never to be lost, is it? In our group prayer, even our collective prayer, our Juma prayer, the Prophet 
taught us that after the collective prayer, the individual makes his own prayer. He also has a relationship, and she has a relationship, personal relationship that they're responsible for, that we are responsible, that I'm responsible for. I put a clock back there, but it stopped. <laughs> we can anticipate the future, right? Even with the tools. <laughs> so, yes. Uh, so this particular verse also got my attention too, in terms of this, the call of Islam in our life. Allah says in the Quran, yes, or you have indeed in the life of the laws of messenger. The Khalqan are left with he the soon. And many of the Imams and the given the book by reference to this verse, they point out the fact that it says he, not with. You have with him, or you have from him. The character comes from him. It's something that can be seen in his, just be seen in his life, in his habits. This is why Aisha Rajallah as saw. This says he, which to suggest to us, most we are sure, as we read, is that it's something within his character, something in his thinking, something in his, his motivation that will serve also as a model. You have indeed in the life of the Lord Rasul, the, life of the best model for him whose hope is in Allah and the day of the hereafter. So Allah is pointing us to the Prophet to study and know the Prophet. Then that means I have to study him, I have to know him. I have, to know, I have to know the life of the God. I have to know the Sira. I have to know how he responded in such situations uh, as the Hadith is. Uh, hadith is understood to be a report of the Prophet's actions, but also of those things that he made no comment about, what he remained silent on. So it says, engages who engages, he's a model for those. And for him whose hope is in Allah in the last day. The man can I, Yarajula, for those conditions again. I think religion should be structured in this sense. Not structured in an artificial sense, but structured in the sense that it respects our ability to make decisions. That's what it is, isn't it? Islam is fruitful, productive, because it respects what Allah created in it. That's a powerful statement, very simple. Once that statement gets out, people are going to be rethinking their religious thinking, their religious ideas. Some notions that have been held for generations, just like in Mecca, really hurt them. They were uh, uh, angry, they lived in anguish as they listened to the prophet, how much it challenged their commitment or their uh, history of being connected to that false worship. That was a very painful, very painful, very painful. But it wasn't painful for Bilal. <laughs> Think about that. They went to fight, they were fighting, they uh, tortured, they killed. But it wasn't painful for Bilal. And he didn't have nothing. But he had something. And what he had was more pressure than what they had because he survived what they did. And he was pointed to climb to the top of the crowd. He was given a position to call, now call all of them, all those haters, <laughs> all those slave masters. You call them. Let them see you. Even some of those who I know are very close and very good Muslims. You need to see this too. So when the prophet prayers be wrong, he said, we are all of the lab. He wasn't talking about no skin. He was something that overthrew that ancient practice of idolatry. Something very powerful that we can see that was revealed to him. He saw it in the law's message. He saw when then Jabril alayhi salam came in. He had a very, we didn't share that. So he, we have to see, we have to trust the fact that Allah sending him, revealing to him, makes him a very special force in our life. So Yarabjula, those who have hope, those who have an anticipation, uh, you know, I tell you, I have to go research these words, but they tell me more. And I need, I need a little bit more. <laughs> Allah made it that way. 
Allah made us to starve so we would ask for more. Allah kept it away from us so we would have an appetite for it. Otherwise, you won't be drawn to it. Because this world is a world that replaces appetite. What Allah tells in the Quran, and I'm sure we know when we think about Ramadan, appetites that are not checked by knowledge. We're not talking about any kind of knowledge. For knowledge of our relation, knowledge of the reality that I have an origin in this matter. And Allah, the one that designed this matter, has also designed my nature, my soul. And unless those two can come together and get married, we're not going to have no children. We're going to be one side. We're going to be all physical or all spiritual. Let's say unbound. So the hope is an important key in this verse. Hope, anticipation. I say how to apply this is really just to apply this one word. I need Allah's help, I need the prophet's example to understand what Allah said. What is about what is this hope in Allah? But I need to have it. So what is this hope? Like? What kind of hope? It's an anticipation. Anticipation. Now already we get off the physical, right? We get really into our conscious mind. We really get into an area where we, where we hide a lot of stuff. As a human being, we can't see it at all, right? And we're always trying to govern ourselves in the best way, right? And the responsibility of self-government is a job by itself for any human being. So I have to understand that there's a hope somewhere here in this hope of Allah, I have to feel, it says that if the person has an anticipation that this thing is going somewhere that is going to give me great joy. I'm going to be so satisfied. I'm going to be fulfilled. That's what this hope is. Hope is that I'm trusting that this is going to give me everything that they took from me, everything that I didn't have, even the things I didn't have the ability to forget. I'm hoping that Allah is going to fulfill the law that the prophet Allah is putting in Muhammad this. The hope is in what? Who has a hope in Allah and the day thereafter. The immediate circumstances are not going to be enough to define that next dimension, is it? Only that comes through revelation. That's God's mercy. That's God's love. I'm telling you about something. Allah is telling you. I'm telling you about something you don't have the ability to see. That's why I'm merciful and letting you see this. Because I love you. And I want to see you fulfill what I've created in you to be fulfilled. So he's not just a man in Arabia. He's a value, a human value that Allah has, allowed, has revealed because he wants all humanity, the mercy to what? All the world. So it's an antip anticipation of, a, of, a, of an event. I'm going to conclude right here. I really love the fact that the, Allah sh showed me in a just to think a thought about Yathrib. They came to visit the prophet on high. They had already heard. And what they heard was enough for them to have interest in him to be first a problem solver. But they accepted his mom. So they saw more than in the prophet than just a problem solver. They wanted a master chief, a big chief. Because they had fought so much. They had fought and fought and fought. And they themselves had got sick of fighting. So they heard, you know, caravan route, right? The message constantly traveling, constantly traveling back and forth, yeah. especially in a word society, a word community, a language community, right? They were waiting to hear what news, what the new language is, what the new ideas are. So when they went, they accepted Islam. And they went back to make, make it short, right? They went back another six, accepted Islam. They went back, Prophet told him to go back and He's considering their offering. They're inviting him. Next time uh, they come back the following year, 6 12, now it's 12. They accept this one. But why did they accept so quickly? And why did they have so much faith in the prophet solving these problems? They didn't have no history of that. They have no history of problem solving. Yeah, he told them to take the, take the road and put the stone back to keep off from killing each other. But they were rebuilding the Kaaba. You might have thought of that, right? <laughs> that really doesn't take a whole lot, right? But that is what drove him to the mountain, Hiram, right? That he was fed up with seeing all this fighting and all this uh, um, partiality and this tribalism. It's because they saw in the Prophet's message that he represented a whole. And what happened? It went from Yathra, Medina Munal, the city of enlightenment. 
So they hope they they recognize they had a hope in Allah. They had the hope in Allah and His Messenger, and they of course they recognize that there's fear of the day of hereafter. That each of us as individual human beings are rightly to come up for judgment. We have not been trusted with our life that we will not be answerable. That is the most mature and the most dignified of creation. It's when you accept responsibility for yourself. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ala Muhammad kama salli ala Ibrahim wa ala ala Ibrahim wa barik ala Muhammad wa ala ala Muhammad kama barak wa ala Ibrahim wa ala ala Ibrahim for I mean in the end of Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulullah Ibrahim, wa ala alihi wa sahabihi wa jama'in, Alhamdulillah. We conclude in khutbah for the salat al jummah. There was a conversation that was had in history, I might have mentioned it before, I believe it was Abu Bakr, it may have been between Abu Bakr and Omar radiallahu anhu. There was a lot of strife after the top prophets passed. Right. But we see that everywhere. And they dealt with it. It was a trial for the whole community, especially for the leadership. It was a trial. And they, they said that once they were able to squash and get but they saw that this needed to have to preserve what we've already established. Now it's got to be protected. Now it's, the prophet's gone. At one point, Abu Bakr and Omar got some long debates. Omar, Abu Bakr just told him, man, he said, the message of Allah is passed now. The revelation is concluded. There's not going to be any more revelation. We are left with our human reality. We can only address issues based on our limited pain. And if we are correct, Allah rewards us. If we're not, then Allah will forgive us and give us more. So they, they made a note that above and beyond all this strife and rebellion that we see, Allah has blessed us to maintain the ship for the next generation to come behind. And he said, but you know one thing, he said the Quraysh, or the, 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 the people, those who now come into, not this Quraysh, the Arabs, now come Islam, none of them have gone back to idolatry. Islam was a success. That's a success. They never went back to idolatry. They could have went back. They could have went anywhere with just a town and said, we're going to start building some make us miles again, right, you know. Come up some new names. <laughs> they never went back. 1975. Ooh. Imam Wafi bin Muhammad Rahim said, from here forward, we're only going to follow that that is in the Quran. What is in agreement with the Quran? What is not, we're going to leave it behind. So I think we can celebrate the fact that we're not going back. We're not going back to anybody's imagination, uh, regardless of what they say their name is, <laughs> or who their father was, <laughs> or, or what ship they saw. No. This conference is symbolic. This conference is symbolic. Mm -hmm. It's not just an event. It's not just a social exercise. It's not just a religious you know, meeting. It represents the essence of our life history. You know, Allah says, uh, the verse about, I don't see the verse, but Allah was saying is in the, that he will give us a light. He promised a light to walk with. And I bear witness that Allah gave us a light. And as I mentioned, Bilal, Bilal had light. 
it wasn't just his strength and courage. He had a light. He had a light, and his light was brighter than slavery. And it was brighter than his slave master's punishment. It was brighter than that. Oh, when they heard Bilal talking about being free, he was following him being free, uh, not slave to anybody. That enraged the slave master. They were so enraged, they tried to crush his body, as the man mentioned last year. Right? Think about this on a psychological level. Bilal was psychologically superior. His spirit was psychological. His body, that's one thing. You know, I said, look. To kill one person, right? It's because you've killed all people. So that's value there, right? But oppression is worse than killing you. Is it going to point to some part, talk to the person inside, right? That is much bigger. And who really is in training for the next life. This world is too small for ourselves. And that's why some I guess they just give up. They say, well, I'm just gonna worship the world because it's just too big for my. Soul is just too challenging for me. But then there are those that say, like Bilal, as soon as he heard it, he was done. He was finished with, he was finished with uh, thinking that they had something of value. Not that he ever thought, he may have never, never thought they had anything of value, these Quraysh. But when the Prophet Muhammad had proved what he had, probably had sensed, when he heard Muhammad, and that's why his friend, his friend that he was had relationship debates with, he couldn't tell him, he said, because he was trapped into his own blindness. You know what he said to him? He said, you think, you, you think like a slave in your skin. He could understand why Bilal felt so free, even though he was a slave. <laughs> because the word is that that really liberates. And is that why they outlaw reading for the slave? <laughs> oh, <laughs> this stuff is unfolding in it. So as I close, I see this it's very symbolic. And uh, our beloved sister, I think about her often, Sister uh, Study Elizwa Fitra, she stepped up to the leadership plate. And that's what Allah says the process of leading men and women are protectors one of another. Ah, that suggests that there's a responsibility to come from both, right? There's an obligation to come from both, but there's leadership to come from both. And over these past few years, she's really stepped out in leadership position. So I really uh, thank Allah for her and for her what she's doing for this community and for bringing to Chicago this very powerful conference. I hope everyone will be there. Uh, your dinner is sold out, but inshallah, there's space for the, for the conference. The fruit of the tree, the fruit of this one. Uh, and that could be women too. But we thank Allah that. Inshallah, this the world will recognize that something very special, as Imam Muhammad mentioned many times, something very special is happening in America to that black slave that was brought over here. And Dr. Juf, Sylvia and Juf, she's taking the level of Islamic history, Islamic for African America to another level, way past the those who just acted for academic sport, right? <laughs> Especially when she talked about Mobile, my hometown. <laughs> uh, she touched me deep. <laughs> plateau, I gotta call my cousin and find where that's when we must go into Plateau. This is before she wrote the book about the slave ship Cotillo, the last ship. I think about 20 Muslims, 20 uh, uh, Africans over, but it became known as Africa Town. We got roots. May Allah bless him, God, doesn't give us mercy in heaven. <laughs> Thank you.